Good evening. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We thank you for uh, taking the time and making the time to come. And we hope and pray that, uh, that as the Holy Spirit leads us into his truth, that we will uh, we'll grow together and uh, you'll find this time uh, profitable and uh, worth the investment. You know, I heard, heard this said many years ago. Every time that you hear the word being taught, you're investing in your soul because you're not going to lose that. Inve- you're always going to gain. And so uh, we always pray at the beginning of the service that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher. He will guide us and give us wisdom. You'll hear words that come out of my mouth, but, but, but before it gets to your heart, something the Holy Spirit's going to get in there and do something with it to, to make it land where it needs to and to, to apply it to your life. Let's pray tonight. Well, I'm going to ask you, uh, we're, we're going to pray for something uh, personal uh, to us, to Diane and myself, our grandson, our great-grandson Judah, uh, Judah and his little sister, uh, Macy, uh, Judah's uh, having the, the, the thing they did with this skull, whatever that, that contraption was that, that brought the plates together the way it's supposed to be, that's being removed tomorrow. And so uh, we want that to go well. He's, he is a big, beautiful uh, eight-month-old, nine-month-old. And so <clears throat> I'll, I'll bat my eyes and he'll be nine years old. But uh, we want to pray for him. We want to pray for Isaac. Uh, we want to pray for Chris. Uh, Chris is in Huntsville Hospital. And uh, the last I heard from Louise is that he was still being evaluated, and they weren't really sure everything that was going to have to be done. And uh, but, but we want to lift that family up. And uh, I know you just got sat down. Will you stand with me just for a second? Father, we come into your presence grateful that we can come with expectation in our hearts that you hear what we say and you know what we need. And Father, tonight we lift up our, our, our brothers, brothers and sisters to you, those that are battling illness, those that are uh, suffering physically. Father, we lift up Chris Bird to you tonight. We pray in the name of Jesus for supernatural wisdom for the doctors. God, that, that, that you will use those doctors and the staff at, at Huntsville, Lord, to be your, your hands and your heart and your wisdom. And uh, Lord, uh, relieve his suffering and pain in the name of Jesus and heal him completely in the name of Jesus, Father. Thank you. Lift up Isaac to you. Thank you, Lord, for the miracle that's in process, and we, we praise you for, uh, for what you're doing already, and we look forward to the fulfillment and completion of that healing. We know it'll take time, but Lord, uh, you, you do all things well in their time. Uh, Father, we lift up Louise to you. We pray for great grace and strength for her, for peace, for wisdom, and uh, Lord, for energy. Uh, Lord, Holy Spirit, rest on her. Energize her. And, uh, give speak life into her soul in the name of Jesus. Father, for every other need tonight, we pray that, uh, God, you know every person, every specific thing, and Lord, we just lay, that, lay those needs at your feet. We know, we know, Lord, that you hear, you hear us and that you care. Uh, thank you, Lord, that you are compassionate, merciful, and best of all, powerful. And uh, Lord, we thank you that we, can, uh, we have our petitions uh, fulfilled as we lay them at your feet. We lift up Danny to you tonight. We pray. Uh, Father, for, the, for the, uh, the doctors that are treating him, we pray in the name of Jesus that, uh, Lord, that, that they, uh, they operate with the wisdom that you grant them in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We just, we depend on you, Lord. We're so grateful. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Teach us. Teach us. And for all that we receive tonight and remember and retain, we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. You may be seated. This uh, is part three of Risen with Christ, and uh, Diane got, got to you, and she gave you a, a copy of the notes there that you can follow along with if you like, or you can just refer to those later on. The scripture we're using as a theme is, is Romans 13, verses 11 to 14. It says, And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let's read that together. Ready? Cast off the works of darkness. And let us, ready? Put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. I want to remind you that if you are born again, you are a spirit being first. Now, you came here with a soul and a body. We know that. 
But the moment that you are born again, at that, at that moment, your spirit ascends or should to its rightful place. That's how God knows you. That's how he relates to you as, a, as, as spirit. And so our saved life, what we do from the, from the moment we say yes to Jesus, at that moment, a, a journey begins where we begin to recognize who we are and whose we are and how we are and what we are in Christ Jesus. And I shared this last week. I'm just hitting a couple of things, and then we'll move, move forward. Our primary enemy is not the devil. Some people have a, have a devil fixation. That's all they talk about, the devil this and the devil that. Our number one enemy is spiritual indifference. It's hard to find Christians anymore who care about spiritual growth. Can I get a witness someplace? This condition breeds all other spiritual ills. The only remedy for spiritual indifference is Holy Spirit birth revelation. I say this to you because I encourage you to pursue this. I believe that God gives us what we ask for. I, I, I heard this many, many years ago. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe it was Mar Mar Mario Murillo that said this. He said, before you put your head on the pillow at night, pray that God gives you revelation in your sleep. He said, I have, I have received things and, and, and not walked them out for years and years and years, but God seeded those things because I asked him for it. So I began praying, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for sleep. Thank you for good sleep. Put something supernatural in there and, and sow it into my spirit so I'll, I'll have it for future reference. And I, my question tonight is this, how long has it been since you last heard the voice of the Lord? You know, uh, spiritual hearing is a glorious, glorious gift. You, should, you, you and I should never take for granted. There are a lot of people who go to church, and I'm not bashing the church. I love the church. We are the church. Amen. But there are a lot of people who, 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 live, who go to church for years and years and years, and all they hear is what a preacher says or what a choir sings or what a teacher says. No, you and I want something beyond that. Can you say amen? We want the Holy Spirit to get us, to, to, to get into us, to, uh, to open our spirit man and to pour revelation in. And so uh, this next picture, this is what we're talking about. This, this is the old you on the left there, the carnal, carnal man. Just look at your neighbor and tell them, that, that ain't me anymore. I know it's not good English, but. And on the right side is the spiritual man. The spiritual man is who you are becoming. If you're if you're in Christ Jesus, uh, you, you are. He sees you in your finished in, in final stage. Thank you, Jesus. But how many of you understand that He deals with us still as children? Amen. Because sometimes we err, we make mistakes, we trip and stumble, and we fall, and we and we do stupid stuff. I'm sure you've never done that, but some of us here have. Maybe some guy standing. But anyway, but 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 we're moving from darkness to light. We're moving from the old uh, the old person. Carnal relates to the flesh. This stuff that's hanging on 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 this. Uh, on, 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 on these bones right now. So this flesh nature, this is not the flesh nature, by the way. This is just the body bag. But this, the flesh nature, uh, it, it's always competing and vying against the spiritual man because the flesh, want, the flesh wants dominance and, and, and ascendance. And, and, the, and so the Bible says the, the flesh and the spirit, what, what do they do? They war. Okay, at some level, at some point, you and I will have to make a decision who's going to win. You know, Louis, you know what I'm most aware of that fight? The moment I get on 431, man, mm. anyway. But listen, I don't drive like a carnal man. I drive like the spiritual man because if I, if I got in the flesh, I might have, have a problem. Go ahead, please, uh, Kenneth, if you would. Thank you. Uh, we read this scripture. We're going to read it again, the, Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. It says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, that may be new terminology to you, you may not know what that means, and, and, and we'll, we'll be deliberate and, and, uh, and help you understand that. For to be carnally minded or flesh minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. How many of you, if you had to make a choice, you would prefer life and peace over death? Amen? And so the spiritual person, the spiritual man, the spiritual mind, is life and peace. And it says, verse 7 and 8 says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The person who uh, functions from the flesh nature cannot please God, because God is spirit. Amen. And so, and we're spirit beings. When we say yes to Jesus at that moment, a spiritual transaction happens that changes everything in our lives. And this is, what I, this is something my wife and I have talked about a thousand times. 
why do people come to church? And the first, only thing that I talk about is where we're going to, where we're going after service. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> where we, where we, they're planning everything about, like, you know, you, the church is like the, this is, this is step one of, of my Sunday or whatever day. And, and so where are we going to eat? Where, where are we going, how do you go this week? Where you, is there a sale someplace? They talk about stuff outside of the realm of the Spirit and then wonder why they don't get anything out of the services. The, the natural man, the carnal mind, is at war against the Spirit. And so you and I have, if we're going to receive something from God, we have to, be con- we have to contend for that thing. Just go ahead and nudge your neighbor and tell them, you've got to fight for it. You're going to have to fight for it. This is something that, uh, and I have lots of Watchman Nee quotes, and I will, I will try to tell you a little bit about Watchman Nee as we, as we go along. Uh, and and this, is, this, is, this is of all, the, I mean, I, can't, I don't know which, which number this is, but in, this is in the top 10,000, okay? This, the particular sin of omission, what is omission? What does it mean to omit something? Talk, talk, tell, me, tell, tell me somebody. To omit, leave it out. Exactly. You, you, you forget, you, or, or you, you, you don't forget, you just overlook it or intentionally. The particular sin of omission, which gives ground to evil spirits, is the believer's passivity. So most of us blame the devil for everything. But you know what? He's really not. Now, now he has power. Can I get a witness someplace? He does have power, and he has a level of authority over those he controls. But he does not control you and me. I said, choir, amen. He does not control you and me. He does not do that. And so, 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 so if, if, I am, if I'm passive, then I'm letting him run, run right over me. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm daring him to hit me. Well, he'll take that, that dare any day. So we cannot be passive. We res- the Bible says resist the devil. Remember this? We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Resist the devil and what? He will flee. And so what happens if you don't resist him? You, 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 you just rolled, rolled, out the, rolled out the red carpet. Come on in. And so we, uh, a lot of people don't like, don't like talking about this stuff because they, they, wanna, they, they just want to just tell me something sweet. and no, Listen, spiritual warfare it happened before you were born again. You, just, you and I just weren't aware of it. Amen. And Satan had us where he wanted us, how he wanted us, the way he wanted us. And when Jesus walked into our world and changed everything, turned everything upside down, at that moment, Satan lost power, lost control, lost authority in our lives. And he can't have it back unless you give him the keys. Now, your neighbor tell him, don't give him the keys. Amen. So we're, n- we're not going to be passive. We're n- Passivity is just you let things happen. No, you go hard after God. I remember years ago, Tommy Tenney wrote a book called The God Chasers. How many of you remember that book, Tommy Tenney? And we were at Cathedral of the Cross at that time in Birmingham, and that book, Pat Saxon was a, was a young evangelist in those days. He had more hair. Amen. And, uh, and, and, and I don't know, the group he had, there was probably 40, uh, what was that school, what was that? Master's Commission, Master's Commission students, 40 Master's Commission students, and those people, man, they devoured those books, and, 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 and it, it set off a, like a wildfire. And so I remember watching these young people. That's why I love young people. I love to see young people because they're eager to learn. They, some of us older folk, you know, we, if we're not careful, we can take things for granted. I'll just leave it there. So we're not going to be passive, okay? Let's go ahead, um, if you would, Kenneth. Thank you. This is what Watchman Nee says in the book, The Finest of Wheat. He says, God, God knows no good resides in man. No flesh can please him. It is corrupted beyond repair. Since it is so absolutely hopeless, how then can man please God after he has believed in his son unless he gives him something new? Thank God. Say it with me. Thank God. He has bestowed a new life, his untreated life, upon those who believe in the salvation of the Lord Jesus and receive him as their personal Savior. This is called regeneration or new birth. Though he cannot alter our flesh, God gives us his life. Man's flesh remains as corrupt as in those who are born anew as in those who are not. The flesh in a saint is the same as that in a sinner. In regeneration, the flesh is not transformed. And we all can bear witness to that, can't we? New birth exerts no good influence on the flesh. It remains as is. 
God does not impart his life to us to educate and train the flesh. Rather, it is given to overcome the flesh. Man in regeneration actually becomes related to God by birth. Regeneration means to be born of God. As our fleshly life is born of our parents, so our spiritual life is born of God. The meaning of birth is to impart life. When we say we are born of God, it signifies we receive a new life from him. What we have received is a real life. I love that. I love that. We used to sing this song, I'm a new creation. I've been born again. Oh, things have passed away. I'm a brand new man. What is that about? Did you ever see people singing that song? They don't sing it like this. I'm a new creation. No, they're happy. Your face shows it. Why? Because it's real. It's real. If you know it's real, and you can't hide that. That's why I just, I, I say often, I, I, the church would have revival if the saints let the glory of God show off their faces. Amen. <laughs> Romans 8 says this. It says, and we know that all things, somebody shout all things, work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined, this is you, saint, this is you. I don't care if you've been saved 20 minutes or 20 years. He also predestined to be conformed. That, the Greek word is suskematizo. You'll see it in a second. Uh, also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. There you see on the left side there. Predestined, called, justified, glorified. God, when God called you, he was finished. He already had your steps. He already had your life planned out. These, these are the processes you're going through to, to, be, to be glorified. And so, but I want you to pay attention to the underline there. He predestined to be conformed. To, to conform is to become like something. And we're going to, uh, you, you remember this, we showed this slide last week. Those four uh, stages or, or, or phases, if you will, of spiritual life, uh, glorified, crowned, seated, and reigning. And those four areas, those four, uh, uh, those four uh, privileges, if you will, that is our spiritual reality. That's where we, we're going now. You may be, um, there's a glorification of the body that cannot happen until we lay this flesh down. Amen? So just, just go ahead and look down there at that old body of yours. Just look at it for a second. Uh, you know, this is as bad as it gets. Amen. Uh, but, but, but the thing is, that this, the, the glorified body is a perfected, eternal reality. It is perfect. It is completely and entirely perfect. It cannot be improved upon. I'm looking forward to that day. How about you? To experience being risen in Christ, with Christ in this life, is the ultimate expression of spiritual union this side of heaven. I wish to goodness that, that saints realized how blessed they are. It's not, well, if I could just, no, you, if, if, if you are in Christ Jesus, you're as blessed as you're ever going to be. You really and truly are. You have to enjoy that. You have to explore that. You have to experience that. Very few believers know that this level of spiritual life is even available. This is going to hurt some of us, but it's the reality, which is why political, social, and soulish activities are by far the norm in most Western churches. Mystic experiences, and I don't mean something weirdo. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about from the Spirit. Mystic experiences such as dreams, visions, impressions, etc. are not sought in and of themselves. Jesus is our goal and sole desire. Can I get a witness someplace? Our mindset opens the door to either fleshly experiences or to experiences with Holy Spirit. Again, Watchman Nee says this. He says, he says, outside of Christ, I am only a sinner. But in Christ, I am saved. Hallelujah, somebody. Outside of Christ, I am empty. In Christ, I am full. Outside of Christ, I am weak. In Christ, I am strong. Outside of Christ, I cannot. In Christ, I am more than able. Outside of Christ, I have been defeated. In Christ, I am already victorious. How meaningful are the words in Christ. If any man be, I wish I had some help in here. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things are made new. So you and I, 
if, 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 we, if Jesus lives inside of us, we are walking this thing out. Now, we're not, we're, we're not perfected yet. Amen, somebody. We're, we're still walking this thing out. We have, we have work to do. God, some people say, why doesn't God just take us straight to heaven? Well, there's two reasons. Number one, uh, you, you've got, some, you've got some, some relatives and family members and friends that need to know about Jesus, and you're the best advertisement going. Amen. So you, you, let them see you. Let, let, them, let them see Christ bloom in your life. Second thing is this. As you walk the Christian road, this, this, this road of, of transformation, what happens is this. You recognize just how far you were. From. Now, when you got saved, when you and I got saved at that moment, we knew something supernatural transpired. Amen. But we did not realize how far God had brought us. Because when you, when you went back to, remember the old haunts used to go to the places you would go and, and you thought that you felt at home there and were comfortable and you try to go back to those same places, but the, it was a different person trying to go in that door? Why, why'd that happen? Because you were new. But you didn't know how new you were until you walked that thing out. So God lets us, he, he lets us, I was, I was saved 37 years ago, and, and I thank God for every second that has passed from that time to this. I can still remember the day, the place, the time, and everything about that day, but I'm not that man anymore. Praise God, he's gone, and a new man is living in Jesus' name. So in Christ, our, all of our hope, everything we, that, that, we're, that we're striving for, everything we're hoping for, everything we're, we're believing for, is, is, it happens in Christ. I know you're going to get sick of watching me. I, I wish I had my original copy of The Spiritual Man. I, 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 I've given almost everything I ever had, had away to somebody at some point. I surely wish I had that book back. He said this. He said, man's thought is always, this is going to blow your mind, saint. I'm telling you, it's going to blow your mind. I'm just going to, let me read it. Man's thought is always of the punishment. Now, you think about this. Tell me if this is not the truth. Man's thought is always of the punishment that will come to him if he sins. Watch this. But God's thought is always of the glory man will miss if he sins. Just let that settle for a second. The result of sin is that we forfeit God's glory. The result of redemption is that we are qualified again for glory. God's purpose in redemption is glory, glory, glory. Can I get a witness any place here? That's God's purpose. That's God's plan. That's God's path. And so, you know, uh, sometimes people just, they just, they believe in osmosis. That, you know, if you put a Bible on that pew and somebody sits by it, that Bible's just going to miraculously trans, you know, move somehow and get immersed and absorbed. No, it doesn't work that way. Here's, I, I like to call this a reality check. Grace is free, but spiritual growth is not. If, you, if you're going to grow, you've got to be intentional about it. I, I, I'm going to say this because I've got to say it. When Diane and I first got, well, when I, when I got saved, she was already saved. Thank God. But when I started going to Sunday school, first, the first church I ever went to, first real church I ever went to, was uh, Plainview Baptist in Tarrant, Alabama. Brother Gerald Wilson was the, uh, was the Sunday school teacher. And it was the sweetest thing on two feet. He was wonderful. And I could not wait. The Sunday morning, if, if Sunday school was 9, was it 9 o'clock, honey? I think it was. 9.30, whatever. But we always got there earlier because I don't believe in being late anywhere. I hate being late. If I'm going to be late, I'm going to stay at home. And so, but we was always the we was the first ones there. And so the kids, would you know, we get, Melissa and Jared would get them in their classes. And sometimes their teacher weren't even there yet. It was so early and. And, and I'd go and I'd say, well, Brother Gerald, what are you going to teach today? And so by the time he had finished telling me what he was going to teach, then it was time for class to start. So I got, I, got tw I got it twice. It was wonderful. Here's what I've noticed. Bible teaching is almost impossible for people. There's no, I don't see the spiritual hunger. I don't know. Why, like, well, I know it. No, you don't know it that well. You don't know it that well that you don't need to hear it again. And so the re I, I'm convinced that the reason why people get stuck in a phase of spiritual growth and stay there is because they don't hunger to go further than, than, they're, than they're familiar with. You all okay? Just know your name and tell them. He's telling the truth. Go ahead. A new way of thinking. This is what Romans chapter 12 says. This, if you don't remember anything else tonight, these verses, if you will, th these are the first Romans 12, 1 and 2 in the, in the King James Version were the first Bible verses I ever memorized. 
in the first probably five years of my Christian existence, I, when I got up in the morning and I said my thank you Jesus prayers for getting me through the night and help me today and all this, and I would, I would quote. I would, I, would, I would quote Romans 12, 1 and 2. That was my constant, that was my go-to because I wanted my mind changed. When you grow up in a cult, you need your mind brainwashed. Amen. Paul says, I appeal to you. This is amplified. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies. This is powerful. To make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Verse 2. Do not be, what's that, what is, in, in, what is it highlighted there? Ready? Do not be conformed to this world, this age. Fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire, entire, say it with me, entire renewal of your mind by its new ideals and its new attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. See, God has a general will and he has a personal will. There, there, some, there, some, there, is, there is what God finds good and acceptable in every area. Then there's those things that God finds good and acceptable and perfect in your life. Okay? So we talked about this word here, this, this word conformed. Suskamatizo is, is the Greek uh, 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 verb there, and it means, it, 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 it means conforming oneself to the outer fashion or outer appearance, accommodating oneself to a model or a pattern. And so, again, Paul says, do not be conformed to what? This, talk to me, this world. Say it with me. This world world. Do not be conformed to this world. And the only other time that that, uh, that, that Greek uh, term is used is in 1 Peter 1, 14. We'll get to it in just a minute. Where it describes those conform, conforming themselves to worldly lusts. In other words, everything revolves around this, this globe, this, this, this uh, 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 atmosphere. And this is so powerful to me. Even apparent or superficial conformity to the present world system or any accommodation to its ways would be fatal to the Christian life. Wow. Wow. Think about that one more time. Even apparent or superficial conformity to the present world system or any accommodation to its ways would be fatal to the Christian life. So if we see the world that we were delivered from as God sees it and as God what he, the way he's trying to paint that, 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 that world he delivers us from is don't go back, don't cross that bridge. You don't want to go back there. Because as far as that world is concerned, you're dead. The Bible says your new life is in with Christ in God. And so that world, that old, the, the old Glenn, the old Randalls, the, all that stuff that, that was in my past, whatever, when, when Jesus severed the tie on October 28, 1984, I never wanted to go back there. I never have. And I'm not perfected yet. I'm, I'm on my way. Glory to God. I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. But there's nothing back there for me. I never had a desire to go back to that. I tried one time to backslide. I think I told you the story already. I tried one time to backslide. An evangelist that I was head over heels in love with and watched uh, religiously on television stumbled and fell back in 1988. And I, did have, I had a problem with that, but my problem was not with what he did. It was the nursing home I went to every Sunday, Rose Manor. I went to that nursing home. And some of those precious saints that they didn't have, whatever money they had, it was, it was little to nothing, but they invested in that ministry every month, and this man crushed them. And Dixie, I was so stinking mad, I wanted to punch a wall. I was just mad. Because somebody that they trusted let them down. And I realized about halfway through my anger, there but for the grace of God go I. I don't have any business judging nobody. Amen? So I began to pray for the restoration of that person. Thank God he's back in the ministry now. But, but the point is this. 
The point is that going back to the world, after you have been delivered, somebody say, I've been delivered. After you've been delivered and, and God set you free and set you on a new path, your affiliation or relation to that world, Bubba that you went to high school with may remember who you are, or, or Sissy may remember who you are, but that, that person, though you retain the outer appearance in some way, shape, or fashion, that person, as far as the world's concerned, is dead. You're not the same. So the scripture says, do not be conformed to the world. Do not be conformed to this, to this world, this age. And this is, this is the other scripture that, that was referenced a while ago. 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 14, but we're going to read the, the, the surrounding verses. It says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Loins speaks, speaks of recreative or regenerative power. They're, they're gird up the regenerative power of your, of your mind. How many understand that, that, a, that a thought, that when that thing is allowed to take root in your mind, you begin to think on it. It starts out as a tiny seed, but it grows quickly. Can I get a witness? So, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, what does it say, ready? Not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. Verse 14, uh, 15 is, is so powerful. But as he who called you is holy, you also, read it with me, please. You also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So when God begins this complete transformation of, of, of us from the inside out, he reminds us, and that's what the New Testament is full, full of reminders because these people grew up in pagan cultures. The, you, you remember about Corinth, don't you? Corinth was, it was the Sodom and Gomorrah and the Las Vegas all rolled into one. It was the most debauched, nasty place. And it amazes me that that's where God chose for the Holy Spirit to thrive in the midst of that perverse culture and the gifts of the Spirit, which are enumerated and qualified and, 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 and elaborated on in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. God takes these pagan, nasty people. They were debauched. They were, they were filthy. They were evil. That's just, that was the culture. I, I, there was a guy named, named uh, David Martin Lloyd Martin Lloyd Jones. He was a he was a, a pastor in, in uh, London, England, for many years. He he wrote tens of thousands of pages on, on the New Testament, including eight volumes on Ephesians, all by themselves. But he said this about about Corinth. He said, the phrase to Corinthianize meant to fulfill every lewd thought or or or, or desire because there was no place in Corinth where you could not get anything you wanted. That's, that's why, that's why when, when these words are recorded for us in the New Testament, we need to understand the culture from which they came. That's why we're reminded here, read it with me one more time, verse 14, ready? As obedient, everybody out loud, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. What does holy mean? Holy is the Greek word hagios. It means to be set apart. It means to, that God, because he loves you, because he put his spirit in you, that you may look just like every local Joe that there is, but you're not the same as everybody else. That's not what God destined for you. God sees you very differently. He sees you as a new creation. When he looks at Sand Mountain, he sees Louis Perry. He sees a saint, not an ain't. Amen. He sees somebody in whom the image of Christ is being, uh, being worked out in, in fulfillment. And so that term there, be holy for I am holy, God invites us to partake of his character and his nature, which is an astonishing invitation. I like to say it this way. If you could see how God sees you, it would change the way you see God.
I've thought this for many years. I fight the urge sometimes to pick up the phone and call somebody. I thought, you know, the way the church has been presented to the culture makes me ill. And I'll tell you what I mean when I say that. It's like Jesus is so lonely and he needs you. Would you, would you give Jesus a, a minute of your time? The kingdom of God. The, have you read Revelation? What's Jesus coming back like in Revelation? He's not some nilly-willy, weak type of needy. No, he's, he does not need anything. He has all power. Can somebody say amen? He's coming back in glory and with honor. And people will be astonished at his, at his appearance because he went out as a lamb slain. But he is coming back as a roaring lion who conquers. Amen. And so, and if that's how God sees, if that's how Jesus is, that's how God sees you. Because you and I are in Christ. We, put, we pretend some, well, I don't want to come on strong. I don't, I'm not talking about being a jerk. Amen. I'm not, ta- I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about recognizing who you are in Christ Jesus and, and recognizing that God sees you as more than you see, how you see yourself. In Judges chapter 6, you know, the, you know the story of Gideon. I'm not going to read it for you. Gideon's hiding in the wine press, uh, doing something that should have been done out in the open, but he was doing that because he was, a, he was very fearful. And uh, the Midianites were oppressing that area, that, the, the, the Jews, and anyway... This angel appears to him. And what does the angel say to him? How's the angel address him? You remember? You mighty man of valor. Wait a minute. The dude's hiding in a wine press. I mean, what's up with that? God sees you as he sees you and knows you. And my, one of my, Diane and I have this discussion often. Lord, please take the blinders off of saints' eyes and let them see you as you see them. One of the reasons why people ask me, are you on some kind of drug? You're always happy. I'm going to tell you something. When you, when you were going to hell and you know it and God set you free, I'm the happiest guy you'll ever want to meet. i got no problems because Jesus loves me. Deal with it. Amen. It's the truth. And this is what I love this. Ephesians chapter 2. This is such a powerful, powerful reality. Let's read it. This is, look to your neighbor before you read it and say, this is about me. Go ahead and tell him this is about me. Yes. Right, let's read it. Ready? And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him. Do you, what do you see to the left there? What, is, what kind of a chair is that? That's a throne. That's a throne. That's a throne. When God sees you, I don't care if you've been saved 28 days or 28 years it doesn't none of that matters if you were in Christ if you were in Christ if, if you were in Christ then you're you're completed you are already completed now you don't see it and I don't see it because we still got this messy flesh hanging on us sometimes they mean somebody but God what's happening every every day of my life every day of your life your saved life God is making us less dependent and, and, and glued to the past and, and the flesh, and he's making us realize this stuff is going to fall off in a New York minute. And in its place, it's going to be a glorified body. It's going to be just like the body of Jesus. It's going to be perfectly permanent and, and, and all that. Can you say amen? Okay, that's where we're going. So when God sees us, now the, the point of tonight is this. The title of this teaching is Risen with Christ. Okay, so... We're, we're going to rule with him and reign with him for a thousand years. You know about the millennial kingdom, amen. Okay. We, don't, we have no idea what all that happens after that. There are many things that are described and depicted in the scriptures. But Paul wants the saints in Ephesus and all the saints in the New Testament era to recognize that as far as God's concerned, that we're already seated with Christ in heavenly places. And I want to tell you this, whether you know it or not, you cannot get an upgrade from that. That is as high as it gets. That's as good as it gets, Amen. 
So let your position, like I said this, but let your position determine your perspective. There are a lot of saints that are, there. they make themselves miserable. I wish I had this. I wish I was this. I wish I would. Stop it. Just stop it. Because you're, you were blessed. I, when we, back in the, back in the glory days, back in the 80s and 90s, um, some of those saints would come in, they'd, strut, they'd come back, that's back in the days when everybody wore a suit to church, amen. You remember that? Looking fine, men just dapper and all that stuff and walking. Hi, how you doing, brother? How's, how's it going, Tom Plant? How's it going, Tom? Brother Tom's about this tall. Always had a new suit on every time. Saw how's it going, Brother Tom? Dressed, with, dressed for the best, dressed with the best, blessed with the best. Always had the same thing. And Tom, he, he taught me something. He said, dress like where you're going. Dress for where you're going. Dress, and, and, and I thought, that guy's kind of arrogant. No, he, he was He said, did you, one day, he, he led the, the ministry team, him and uh, anyway, what's her name? You know, she had the drugstore in Eastlake. Anyway, we'll come in a second. But that, this is what they tell me. They would say, you know what? Today, the phones are going to ring, and people who are desperate for hope I'm going to be on the other end of the line. God, give me the voice of your spirit and speak through me. Speak hope and life through me. And we, every Sunday we prayed that prayer. And I'm going to tell you something. I did not realize it. I was just in, I was recruited. I was a, I was a raw recruit. I was, that was back in the day. I mean, Diane will tell you. I was so hungry for, for Jesus. If somebody asked me to sweep the street, and, and, and I'd done anything and encountered an honor. Tom, Tom and, and those other guys said, come on, help us with this. And I would pray that prayer. We'd hold hands, and I'm, I can see your face, honey. I just can't call a name. And, and we'd hold hands, and we'd pray, Lord, please speak through me. Speak through me. And those phones would start ringing because the broadcast would come on at 7 o'clock, and before it ever started and even after it went off the air, people were calling desperate, desperate for hope, desperate situations. And we would pray, God, many of, many of them, the first people I ever led to the Lord, beside my brother Mark, was on, on the on the on the phone. And here's what I remember. The last thing Tom would say before we started answering phones was he says, "Give him hope, give him Jesus." And I would pray. And I'm praying the whole time, Lord, please, please. I'm listening to. I'm I'm praying inside, Lord, please let me speak as an oracle of God. I'm listening to every word this person is saying. Heartbreaking situations, deaths, cancer, all kinds of things. And I found out something. Until you know who you are in Christ, you can't give hope. God doesn't need any pep talk, people. He needs people who understand who they are in him, who can speak life. I believe in that. Speak life. Say it with me. Speak life. Because you and I are ambassadors of the king. We are, we are don't take this the wrong way because I'm, I'm not an arrogant soul. That's not how I operate. But, but we are royalty. How many believe that? We're royalty. We really and truly are. So you let your position determine your perspective. You don't go by what you see in the natural. You go by what God says you are in the spiritual. Can I get a witness someplace? Ephesians 4 says this. Let me say this then. Speaking for the Lord, live no longer as the unsaved do. And here's why. For they are blinded and confused. And everybody said amen. Their closed hearts are full of darkness. They're far away from the life of God because they have shut their minds against him and they cannot understand his ways they don't care anymore about right and wrong and have given themselves over to impure ways they stop at nothing being driven by their evil minds and reckless lusts verse 20 says this but that isn't the way christ taught you let's read that together but that isn't the way christ taught you verse 21 if you have really heard his voice and learn from him the truths concerning himself, then throw off your old evil nature, the old you that was a partner in your evil ways, rotten through and through, full of lust and sham. Now, your attitudes and thoughts must all be constantly changing for the better. Yes, you must be a new and different person, holy and good. Clothe yourself with this new nature. Clothe yourself with this new nature. What is the Christian life? It's learning day by day to clothe yourself with this new nature. We're not, what we're going, we're not in our ultimate final stage in terms of 
the way we are at this moment as we see each other. God sees us perfected, but we're getting there. I said we're getting there. It's a slow go sometimes, but we're getting there. Now, this is my last turn. On the, uh, I'm, I'm, we're in the home stretch right now. Watch this. There's nothing I can say. This is, this is the first thing. When Jesus is sold as a deluxe version of life, it's the most gross misrepresentation possible. Jesus did not come to give you a better life here as much as he came to give you a new life there. This is what, what, what Brother Watchman, he said this. I, I, I can't improve on it. Separation to God. Separation to God. Separation from the world is the first principle of Christian living. In other words, we... We know where we came from, but we're not there anymore. Now, we, we, we still have these physical bodies, and we still have to walk on terra firma and all that. We're doing all that, but, but, but that's not what that's about. Separation from the world does not mean that we leave this place. It means that our minds, our spirits, our souls, we're all, we are sitting in heavenly places already. Can I get a witness someplace? Okay, so that's separation to God. Separation from the world, that's what we, it, it's, it's tempting to just, to just see the world as a playground. We can just enjoy ourselves and have all the fun that we, can, that we can muster, right? That's not what the Bible says. That's not what God wants from us. We have to be separate from the world. Now, it doesn't mean we die physically. We'd be of no benefit. Amen. But spiritually, separation from the world is the first principle of Christian living. This is my last slide right here. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Kenneth. I appreciate you. Life is all about perspective. There's two, there's two different realities there. In the middle there, you see the battleground. That's where, that's where you and I live. We live on the battleground. There's, there's a war here every day. Can I get a witness someplace? We fight for our lives. We fight for our spirits. We fight for, for, for uh, God's purposes to be fulfilled in, our, fulfilled in our lives every moment of every day because, because we're at war. This is not a peace time. This is a war time. So we, we're on that battleground. And so from the, on the top side there, the spiritual man, you see, the, you see those, two, those two thrones, if you will, those two, two seats, Christ and me. I am seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Just nudge your neighbor and tell them, I'm seated with Christ. Go ahead. Just tell them, I'm seated with Christ. That's us. That's where we are. The spiritual man lives there, lives in heaven. The natural man, all these other conditions, the natural man is bound. He sees from, from the canopy down. All, he doesn't see beyond that. He sees from the canopy down. He just sees what he can, and, and, he's, and he's, he or she is limited to the uh, taste, touch, and feel, and all the senses. They're sense-driven. They're sense-controlled. They're sense, they, 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 they fulfill their senses. That's all, they, that's all they know about. So look at these things, okay? Fear. Fear is not a spiritual thing. It's, it's not, a, it's not a, a spiritually generated. Now, I'm not talking about the fear of God. I'm talking about the fear of anything here. So the natural man is a fearful person. The natural man is bound in the world of emotions. Why'd you do that? Well, I just felt like it. We almost beat our son's hands off because he felt like it. You know, amen. Emotions. Emotions. How many of you believe with me? Emotions can deceive you. Can you say amen? Stress. Stress is, does not belong to the spiritual nature. Remember back in the day, honey, somebody said, well, I'm too blessed to be stressed? I thought, well, that's kind of arrogant, but it was the truth. It really was the truth. Frustration. Uh, any, any, don't, don't raise your hand. Anybody frustrated today? Kelly, I said no. Don't say anything. <laughs> no. Why is that? Because we're surrounded by imperfection. If it's ours, it don't bother so much. But if somebody else is, woo, mm, frustration, pain. I said the, the crabbies. I mean, I'm just, you know, some people just got attitude. That's just all it is to it. 
hormones. Sometimes we're just not in control. Can you say amen? Sickness. Sickness is not from God. Can I get a witness someplace? Anxiety. What's the Bible say? Be anxious for what? Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Failure. And the last thing there is the worst thing, hopelessness. I read this recently. Most of us know someone in our families or friends, maybe class, ex classmates, whatever, that has attempted suicide or committed suicide. And uh, Dr. James Dobson, about, it's probably been 10 years ago or so, he had a guest on his program. He talked, his, his uh, topic was, was uh, the cost, the exact cost of hopelessness. And this is what he said. I never forget it. I was, well, actually, we were still in Texas, so it was 12 years ago, maybe. He said this. He said, hopelessness colors your world black, even though the sun is six inches above your head. Hopelessness covers, colors your world black, even though the sun is six inches over your head. And I thought there is no better definition. Hopelessness turns everything in your world upside down so that all you see is the bottom. You don't see the top. The natural man, this is why people, why are drugs so prevalent? Why, 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 is, why was this known as Meth Mountain? I don't know if it still is. I think it's God's mountain person, but it, why, why was it known? Why was it called that? Because hopeless people do hopeless things. They try to medicate their pain any, any old way they can. So all those conditions, all that belongs to the natural man. That, that, is, that is not you. If you're in Christ Jesus, that is not you. So you don't have a reason to be hopeless anymore. Can somebody say amen? You don't have now our emotions. See, it's, it's okay to have emotions because God, they're, they're built into the, the human container. But, but make sure that you have your emotions and that your emotions don't have you. Amen? Because that's when it gets dangerous. Frustration. Frustration is when you, when you try to cram your timetable and your, and your expectations in somebody else's container. It don't work that way. Pain. Pain is unavoidable. The pain of disappointment, the pain of shame, the pain of failure. How many, how many of you want to fail? None of us do. But when we fail, and we will, when we fail, what, what happens? What do we do with that? Do we internalize it? I'm worthless. I'm a piece of... No. You, that's like anything else, any other. If you stumble and fall, you get up, you dust yourself off, and you take that thing to Jesus, and you say, Lord, here it is. I can't fix me. You can. You, I need you. Amen, somebody? And so the battleground is where we live right now. The, the battle, you and I are in the middle. Every day we make a choice, either to, to live ra seated with Christ in heavenly places, and that forms our perspective, or we're on the bottom side looking up. And everything is a problem. Everything is causing pain. Everything is, is, is sickness, anxiety, failure, hope, all that stuff. And so the battleground is really where the, where the war is won or lost. I lied to you. Well, I didn't lie. I just fudged. Okay. Can I two more slides? Satan is our vindictive accuser that's his job his job is when you and I make a mistake his job is to stick his finger out and say I knew you would I knew this was coming you worthless amen somebody watch this let's read this together ready go ahead please and they overcame him and they overcame him they overcame him. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. That's, that's something you and I could not do for ourselves. Amen. Jesus did that for us. And uh, I know this is futuristic, but this principle is true of the Christian life. And by the word of their testimony. How do you get a testimony? You have a test. 
the, the things that come your way in mind sometimes, and, and we wish to goodness that, that we could avoid those things, and for some reason God permits them. Why does he do that? Why does God permit that? He, he could have kept, he could have kept that, that, that temptation from me. He could have. But you need the experience. You're going to have to fight that thing. You're going to have to fight that devil sooner or later. Can I get a witness someplace? You can't keep postponing the, the spiritual warfare. You're going to have to fight that thing. And you recognize that, that when God, and when he, get, when he gives you the victory, and he gives you the victory, he will. But when, when you conquer, it's not your strength. It's his strength in you. Amen? They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. This is the accuser of the brethren, by the way. Satan. And by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Why? Because if you are in Christ Jesus, you are already immortal. You're immortal. This clay frame that you see tonight, this piece of whatever this is, you know what? Lisa, one day, Marston, one day, glory is going to cover this whole frame. It's going to be brand new. It's going to look like it has never looked before. It's going to be a glorified body. It's going to be a perfect body. It's going to be a permanent body. And until that moment comes, I'm going to have to fight. That's why every day I'm in the Word every single day. Not because it's an occupational necessity. God forbid. It's because this Word is my lifeline. And it's yours as well. This is what arms us for the battle. Stand with me if you would please. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you if you, had to, if you had to fight the enemy today. I know you did. Because if you, if, you, if you took two steps out your front door, you were, you were in warfare. Amen. Here's what I want you to know. It doesn't matter if, 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 you, if you struck out the first two times and fouled off the third pitch. Just keep swinging. Don't quit. And if you, when you fail, and we fail, when you fail, instead of, instead of buying the coal that, for Satan to throw at you, just bear yourself in the love of Jesus and say, Father, thank you for great grace, for your amazing mercy. Thank you for forgiving. Thank you for restoring. Thank you that your love, your love is always consistent. Your love does not depend on my performance. Your love is a reflection of your perfect character. Father, tonight I lift up my brothers and sisters in this room. You know what we're dealing with. Everyone's temptations or areas of weakness are a little bit different than the other. But Father, what we need most of all is we need to know that Jesus is for us, not against us. We need to know that when we stumble and fall, you are still for us. You still love us. Your plan is not preempted. You don't discharge us from our assignments and say, I'm going to fill your spot with somebody else more worthy. No, you love us through it. You love us through it. Father, tonight, we can think of dozens of times where we've blown it. But the truth is, the reason why we have a smile on our face, a spring in our step, and hope in our hearts is because you are faithful even when we are not. Holy Spirit, remind us of who we are. Remind us of whose we are. Remind us of where we are. Your word says we are seated in heavenly places in Christ. That's the safest, surest place I know. Fear can't enter there. Insecurity cannot enter there. Hopelessness cannot go there. Fear has no place there. In Christ, I'm secure, I'm confident, I'm certain. I'm certain, Father, that 